As I walked with you through the five steps of hypothesis testing, we had a decision to make. Considering our sample mean of baby weights and the world population of baby weights, we had to decide whether that sample mean was statistically significantly different than the population mean. And we made a decision. And every time we make a decision with hypothesis testing, we could make a mistake. There are two types of errors that we could make, and they are creatively named type one and type two. Two, let's explore these errors in decision making. When you reject or accept a null hypothesis, you can make a mistake. The null hypothesis could be true, but you reject it. Alternatively, the null hypothesis could be false, but you accept it. Now I know that I'm being sloppy with my language here because Last time I stressed for you that we never accept a null hypothesis, we only fail to reject. However, I'm being deliberately sloppy for this example. I'm making it more clear at the expense of specificity. However, you know that we don't accept a null hypothesis, we fail to reject. It's just going to be easier for our learning if we use these somewhat sloppy terms. Let me begin with an example of how errors in hypothesis testing are typically explained in a textbook or some other table that you might find. Here we have a table of statistical errors. We see at the top the true state of the world, where the null hypothesis is true or the null hypothesis is false. And we see two potential sample outcomes of either accepting or rejecting the null hypothesis. We've cross-tabulated correct decisions with errors. This table is difficult to follow, where we have a true state of the world and a true null hypothesis that gets rejected correctly or incorrectly. So let's step back from hypothesis testing for a moment, and instead we'll use a different kind of testing, one that might be easier to wrap our minds around. At any given time, Everyone in the world is either pregnant or not pregnant. Doesn't matter who you are, you're in one of those two categories. You can't be in both, you can't be in neither. And at any given time, you could take a pregnancy test. And that test will give you one of two results. The test will either tell you that you are pregnant or that you are not pregnant. Therefore, we can cross-tabulate these potential results. In this case, the true condition of the world is you are either not pregnant or pregnant. And the result of the pregnancy test you took would either be negative, not pregnant, or positive, pregnant. If the test says that you're not pregnant and you in fact are not pregnant, then this is a correct result. We've not made an error. On the other hand, if the test is positive, saying that you are pregnant, and in fact, you are pregnant, this is also a correct result. We have avoided making an error. On the other hand, if the test says that you're pregnant, and you are not, in fact, pregnant, this is an error. We call it a type 1 error. The alternative would be when the test says that you are not pregnant, and in fact, you are. And this is called a type 2 error. Now let's explore these two errors a little more deeply. A type one error is a false positive. It's saying that you are pregnant when in fact you are not. And that feels a little bit like lying. It's saying that something is true when in fact it is not. A type two error occurs when the test is a false negative. You are pregnant, but you don't know it yet. Both type 1 and type 2 errors come with their own set of consequences. Let's start with type 1 errors. A type 1 error occurs when we believe that there is a genuine effect in our population when in fact there is not. The probability of making a type 1 error is the alpha level, which is typically 0.05. A type 1 error is saying that this drug worked, 
when it doesn't work, that this intervention is effective when it wasn't, that this education improved outcomes when in fact it did not. And that sounds a lot like lying, saying that something is true when it is not. You can remember a type 1 error by thinking of Pinocchio. What happens when Pinocchio tells a lie? His nose grows. It gets longer. And so you could think of a type 1 error as Pinocchio's nose growing. That's a type 1. It is saying something is true when in fact it is not. And this could have huge consequences for us as researchers. If you publish non-significant results saying that there is a statistically significant difference, if you have a false positive, if you are saying that this intervention is effective when it's not, that could really damage your career. We would want to be very careful to not make type 1 errors. Here's an example of a real type 1 error that actually occurred. Researchers studying the effect of ecstasy on the brains of lab rats showed that ecstasy created the same level of brain deterioration as pure methamphetamine. Other brain researchers at the time who were also studying the effects of ecstasy on the brain thought that those results looked off. They had not seen those kinds of results in their own studies. They replicated the study as it had been published and did not find the same results. Eventually, the original researchers had to go back and examine what drug they were giving their lab rats. And it turned out there had been a mix-up at the lab. That instead of using ecstasy, these researchers, unknown to themselves, were delivering not ecstasy, but pure methamphetamine to the brains of these lab rats. And that was why they were finding those results. When that happens, you have to retract those results, which is embarrassing at best and can result in the loss of funding or other consequences to your research career. It's important that we make sure and do our very best that we always are telling the truth statistically, that we're not making type 1 errors. A type 2 error occurs when we believe that there is no effect in the population when in reality there is. The probability of making a type 2 error is your beta level, which is often established as a 0.2 or the inverse of 80%. In a type 2 error, we miss the effect that actually exists. Our mnemonic device for a type 2 error is to think of a dunce cap that might be used in an old English parochial school. That type 2 error is like the dunce cap on the head in that form. When would a type 2 error occur? Many times type 2 errors occur because our sample size is too small. There is an effect, but we don't find it because our study is underpowered. But you might say a type 2 error isn't nearly as serious as a type 1 error because if we make a type 2 error, we miss the effect that's there, we won't publish those results and no one will know. But here's why a type 2 error can be just as serious or perhaps more serious than a type 1 error. Let's say we are studying the effect of a specific type of drug on cancer cells. And with our very small sample size, we miss an effect of this drug on a specific form of cancer. This drug isn't going to work on most types of cancer, but for one very specific form of cancer, this drug is highly effective. It's just that we miss that effect because there are too few of the subjects with that type of cancer in our study. By missing that effect, by making a type 2 error, we leave that effective drug on the shelf. It never gets marketed. And then maybe you or someone you care about develops this type of cancer, and yet the drug that can help you isn't available. That's why type 2 errors matter as well. What we're going to want to do is determine the rates of type 1 and type 2 errors and do our best to minimize both. 
There are ways that we can go about doing that that have to do with sample size and power analysis, and we'll explore those in later videos. For now, it's important that we know that we can make a type 1 error, which is like Pinocchio's nose lying, saying something is true when it's not, or a type 2 error, a dunce cap, you missed the effect, you big dummy. So now, let's look at that original table again. We can see the true state of the world, a condition where the null hypothesis is true or false, and a sample outcome in which we accept or reject the null hypothesis. You could spend a little time with this table to try to unpack it and better understand it. I still think that table is confusing, but I bet you'll have an easier time understanding it now that we've used these kind of silly examples that will help you understand the difference between type 1 and type 2 errors in hypothesis testing.